Hello, and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today, my guest is Gary Sanker. Hey, Gary, how are you doing? Hi, I'm great. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. To give our listeners and viewers a little bit of background on you, by day, Gary Sanker is a marketing professional banging out marketing plans, business plans, and copy for B2B and B2C clients. By night, he takes the lessons of human behavior and crafts them into flash fiction stories. His work has appeared in over a dozen print anthologies and online sites. His nonfiction columns on writing and various marketing topics have appeared in a variety of publications. He founded and continues to run the Mainline Writers Group and the Wilmington Chads Ford Writers Group to help local authors better their craft and reach their publishing goals. And his party game, Writers Blocks, and that's B-L-O-X-X, helps others bring their stories to new audiences. And I've known Gary for a long, long time. And I met him through some of those writers groups that I had mentioned. And we periodically get together and brainstorm about marketing topics. And we just had a super fun meeting over coffee a couple, probably a couple of months ago at this point. And I was really intrigued with some of the ideas that Gary brought on book marketing lessons from beyond the book world. So I invited Gary to be on the podcast just to talk about some of these more out of the box ideas wow. for book marketing at, from outside the book world. And so Gary, what I thought I'd do is you had given me a couple of categories of areas where you had learned great lessons. I just thought I'd throw sure. out some of those topics and we can talk about what you've learned. So the first one, which I find very intriguing is the comic book industry. I find so, it intriguing too. <laughs> yeah. Talk a little bit about like where you got your exposure to the comic book industry. Well, first I'll tell you that this is an amazing time to talk about this. I just came back from the Baltimore Comic Con yesterday. Oh, cool. So, you know, now all sorts of 2022 things that are going on. My background was when I was six, I think a neighbor lent me his Superboy comic. I still remember it. <laughs> and after that, my dad used to take me to the farmer's market where that industry used to basically, they'd sell whatever they could off the newsstand and the vendors got 20% of the profit. And then the remainder that they couldn't sell, the comic book industry didn't want them back. So they cut off part of the whole cover. And then those people would give them or sell them to a farmer's market or something. And they would sell them for a third of the cover price. And so I built up a collection doing that when I was 8, 10, 12, until I had money that I could spend on my own and started buying comic books. And I read voraciously. Didn't read books, read comic books. And you know, spin ahead when you actually have money and you can buy real things that you want to buy. I ended up with a huge collection. So the industry has gone through a lot of change. It went through change much earlier than traditional book publishers went through when they began to set up stores, when stores went into business, specifically selling comic books instead of getting it off the spinner rack at the drugstore or at the Barnes and Noble or whatever it is. So they went through their changes a lot earlier and experimented a lot with how do I sell more issues, more copies? And that's what I've been watching all along as I've been collecting. And they do amazing things with covers and everything. But that's my history with comic books. So as you are not a comic author yourself, but you're looking right. for ideas on how to market your books, what are you learning from some of the things that the comic book industry is doing for marketing? It's a great question and a great thing for people to look at. So remember, the comics have two different elements. They've got the art and they've got the writing. And the art principally takes precedence over the writing. Although once you read a book and it's terrible, you, your evaluation is it isn't a good book. But they do a couple things that are very interesting. One is they make different covers for the same book. So recently they've done some like 80th anniversary annuals for DC comics, like Superman, Batman. They'll do 14 covers for the same comic in order to get people to buy the comic more than once. The same material inside. They'll get people to buy it three, four, five, or their goal would be as many times as they have covers. They enhance the covers. They spend a lot of money doing special covers. Over history, they've done blind embossing. If you know what that is, that's when the material is pressed up so that it's like a relief map. They've done color forms, the equivalent. They didn't call it color forms, but they've done that where the cover's glossy and they give you pieces of plastic to stick all over the cover. They do foil stamping. They do all sorts of things. They do cardstock. They even do blank white covers so that an artist can go and draw on them. And again, some of this won't be relevant to a writer, but the lessons behind them are very interesting, right? Because an, a publisher, especially an indie publisher, because think about, you can do anything you want 
with your book and your cover that the publishing industry would ignore or resist because they go, no, there's no reason to do that. You can do anything you want. You want two covers to your book? That's great. And then think about how you could use two covers. Do you have one that permanently says autograph by? Do you go to an event and you say, okay, I'm going to print 50 books up or 100 books up with a special cover that lists the event on the cover? You can do that. All you need is one more ISBN. So um, I, I already have a bunch of questions. So I'm going to stop okay, go for ahead. a moment. Go ahead. So, it's just an exciting thing to look at what they do. It absolutely is. In the authors, could adapt those. Yeah. I had a question right away because you said that many of the comic book industry producers are creating multiple cover designs for the same story. So yeah. I'm hoping that the readers aren't surprised when they realize it's the same book, that the readers, the purchasers of comic books know that it's the same content, but they're buying it again because they specifically want they, that new cover. They always know because the issues are numbered. They're issued okay. at one or 100 or 1,000. So they know what they're buying. And they know why they're buying it. So I've seen books that do two side-by-side -side books. So that when they display them, they fit together to be a single picture. That is cool. I think that's, it is really cool. And that's in publisher-run books. But they don't do a lot of that. I've only seen it on rare occasion. But it's really cool to look at. So one might be the half of an image with the red background. And one might be half of an image with a gray background or a green background. And the whole is to make better shelf presence out of that cover. Well, it is interesting because I think a lot of our listeners, not all, but a lot of them are going to be novelists. And so I can imagine a cool effect, especially if you were somebody who could get books into bookstores and had control over how they were displayed. So that's even a small, small percentage of people in the traditional right. publishing world. But right. if you had a cover that had two halves of a face and one half would be on one cover and the other half would be on another cover so that if they were displayed correctly together, you would see the full face. That would be cool. Right. But the amount of control that would be needed in a bookstore would be enormous. Like I can imagine only the Stephen Kings and the J.K. Rowlings of the world would ever have the influence to do that. But if right. you're selling your own. You have total control yeah. over how you display your books. Yeah. And again, it's really, if you're doing print on demand and you're not buying 500 or 1,000 at a time, you can buy as many as you want. So you can buy 10 of every cover that you have and make a very, very interesting display. Imagine you have one novel. So you're buying a table someplace. And how do you make that look better? How do you make it look bigger? Yeah. You get four different covers and you show it as a quad. Do anything you want. Yeah. Another way I'm imagining this could play out is Let's say, so one of my books has part of it set in the Philadelphia area and part of it is set in Sedona, Arizona. Mm -hmm. So the geography in both places is quite recognizable. So I can imagine that if I had a, the kind of author business where I had a physical presence in the Philadelphia area and in the Sedona, Arizona area, right. I might get books, one of which emphasized the Sedona locale and one of which emphasized the Philadelphia locale. Right. Would you always just reserve those for in-person sales? Or if you were selling them online on uh, one of the big retailers, would you ever do that? I would do anything that would help increase borrowed interest in my book. As indie authors, what we find is we don't have the reputation of Stephen King. How do you pull people in? Well, you pull people in by author name. You pull people in by the title and the look of the cover, and you pull people in by something else of interest, the genre, or in your case, as you said, location is a great way to do it. So two different covers would be an amazing thing to do. And you can yeah. show, even if you're on Amazon, you can only show one cover up front as the first image, but you could show a number of different images if you wanted to. I think that would be an amazing use of it is two different physical locales on the cover. So if you were putting it up on Amazon, let's say, and you had two different covers for the same content, I'm trying to think through like the Amazon terms of service and T's and C's here, that obviously Amazon doesn't want to fool a reader into thinking they're two different books. So would you just pick one of those? I've I'm trying to work through it, the logistics of I've this. never done it this way, but yeah. one is to make the second page the alternate cover. Yeah. In yeah. color. Yep. There, there are a lot of ways you could probably do it because you're right. 
What you don't want to do is confuse Amazon or the reader. Right. Because you don't want them returning books and being disappointed and giving you bad reviews. So you could certainly choose one. You know, the other things we talked about were the cover is not the only thing you can do. As an indie author, you can do things that the book companies will not do. One is you can create extra content. You can create interstitial chapters with QR codes or whatever to access those interstitial chapters. They could earn that interstitial chapter and interstitial meaning between two chapters by having them visit a place and get a QR code by proving that they bought the book or it can be included in the book with a QR code. So Nicole Valentine, a long time ago, appeared at the Brandywine Valley Writers Group. And at the time she was doing young adult fiction. And this was probably 10, 12 years ago. But we talked about the fact that there's so many opportunities. Used to be, there were a couple books that basically made it so that if you were reading and you walked into a Starbucks, there was a chapter that had to do with Starbucks in it. And you would get access to that by going to the Starbucks. So there's a lot of things you could do that kind of broaden the experience for the reader and make it more interesting, whether it's programmed ahead of time and they know it, or whether it's a surprise. And QR codes are pretty amazing, right? Because you could have any content. So what could you do? Well, you could take this interview, if this were relevant to your book, and put a QR code in the book and show them a podcast that they'd never be able to get the full experience of by having a printed book. But that QR code could be embedded in the book. And you don't need just one. It could be five or six QR codes. When I indie published my book of flash fiction, I had already read seven of the stories live. And so I put a QR code behind those seven stories so that people could watch the story as well as read it in the book. It's just a different way of thinking. How do I make my book special? How do I make it yeah. more interactive? How do I build my audience for the next book? I really like that example because when you were first talking about the QR codes, I could think of all sorts of pretty obvious ways that you could right. use that for nonfiction. Like I have a book on podcasting for authors. And one of the things I put on my website is tips for guests for the podcast. And so right. if that would be an obvious connection, but I really like that suggestion for readings as a way that fiction writers can do that. And especially for short stories, because then you're not worried about taking the reader out of the experience mid story, like in the middle right. of a novel, they're at the end of the short story and they see the QR code and they say, oh, we're gonna get to see the author himself or herself reading right. it. That's very cool. Part of it is that hopefully every indie author is building their platform before they release their book, right? So hopefully they've done readings, they've got recordings of different things. So it could just be an interview. It could be as simple as one interview that you did that's 30 minutes with someone. And that doesn't take you out of the book. That just deepens the experience. Again, remember, people are interested in the story, but in a lot of cases, they're interested in the background of who they're reading or the background of the book. Suppose you had some interesting background material on the location and you did a mini whatever it is, whether it's a PowerPoint or something that gave people additional information on the background of the location of what they're reading yeah. or some historical event that they're reading about. There's tons of opportunity here. Yeah, I really like an idea I can imagine playing out is uh, some of my other novels are set in on Mount Desert Island, Maine. Definitely one of the most gorgeous places in the world. And there are lots of royalty-free images on Unsplash, for example, or for purchase on Deposit Photo or other sites like that. And it would be fun at the point where they're all going to Otter Cliff or they're all going to Jordan Pond House or they're all walking down the street in Bar Harbor. It would be fun, I think, although I'm still a little bit on the fence about this, but I think it would be fun to give them the option of clicking over to it. But I think authors have to weigh it carefully because if they're reading about walking down the street in Bar Harbor, and then they click over to see the picture. You never know if they're going to say, oh, Bar Harbor, I'd like to go there. I'm going to go over to Travelocity and look at, you know, you might have lost them. So right. I just think balancing that, rounding out the experience against interrupting the flow of what you're trying to tell them in the book. So placement would be really important. Very few people read a novel start to finish, or I'm guessing very few people read a novel start to finish in one sitting. So at the end of chapters where it's appropriate, where it adds yeah. some context, it adds some texture yeah. to it. 
could be very effective, but you're right. You have to be careful on what you do, how long it takes them out of the story. And does it really take them completely out of the story or is it complementary to it where they're still kind of involved in the story as they're going through the extra material? You can do extra chapters, which is an amazing thing to be able to do or extra content. And that content doesn't have to come from the book. It could be someplace else. Right. Yeah, I think at a minimum, it's easy to say you can almost always put something at the end of the book that hopefully Mm -hmm. will connect the reader more closely to you and is definitely not going to take them out of the story. And then it's sort of like the graduate level to consider if you can insert those kinds of things in the middle of the story. At Comic-Con, now I've been to the large one in California, and that's a whole different experience. So the publishers there will do a lot of interesting things. They'll they'll publish little 48 pages or 32 page sampler of a book. You've got an opportunity. If you've got a book, you've got, and they have either purchased it or you've given it to them and they've got your novel. You've got an audience right there. And I always wring my hands when I go, oh, and what did you put in the back of the book? Did you put ads for your other books? Did you put anything that links them back to you in some way? And most people say no. And I go, Oh, I want to pull out what's left of my hair. You've got the best vehicle you could ever have. Why aren't you using that? And by the way, it doesn't have to be your book. Maybe you have an association with maybe a mystery writers group or something. <laughs> and you agree to cross promote each other's books as a favor to each other. Yeah, I really like that one sort of similar suggestion that I've read about that I kind of resist is the newsletter swap idea. So the reason that I've resisted it in those circumstances is that the recommendation is always in your author newsletter, coordinate an author swap with someone else, and you can share their audiences. The reason I resist that is that I feel like if I'm going to recommend a book, it has to be a book that I've read and enjoyed, which kind of limits it already. If I read, let's say a book a week and I like three quarters of those well enough to recommend them. I'm still kind of limiting the pool of people I could do a swap with. But if you're employing that kind of sharing of an audience in your book, then you can be very choosy about what books you decide to include there. Absolutely. So you might promote the writer's group as a whole and just say, hey, this is where you can find other information. Let people choose which are the stories that seem to interest them and whatever. So you're not giving your endorsement to something that isn't good enough, or you can promote actually other people's books, other people's writings, but you've got this whole thing there. And to put that out and not have used the back of that book is a terrible shame and it's a terrible waste. Yeah. Yeah. I think one homework assignment for everybody is going to be go to the back of your books and (laughs) Make sure that those kinds of ads are there and the links. And I'll just also put in a plug for Vellum, which is the software that I use to format my books. And Vellum is such that if you are creating eBooks with actual links in them and you put in, like at the end of each of my series books, I have a link to the next book in the series, obviously. And at the end of the last book in the series, I have a link to the first book of the other series. So if I put the links in Vellum to Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Kobo and all the other places, then when I generate the books, the version that Vellum generates that I put up on Amazon has an Amazon link. And the one it generates to put up on Kobo has a Kobo link. And so you're never insulting a retailer by sending them to somebody else's site itself is worth the price of admission of Vellum. Also think about the fact that the first book you write, you don't have a lot to put back there, but the fourth book, you don't know that they've read that as the fourth book. They may have picked up. So think about what you can do for your first three books. Do you print the first five or seven pages of the story for each of them with the cover? And of course, that becomes part of your ad, right? But an ad doesn't have to be a single page and it doesn't have to be a page spread. That reference to that other book that you've published or that you're kind enough to give to someone else could be more than just an ad. It could be the first chapter. Yeah, I've started doing that. I have links to all my books at the end of the book. But even before that, I have the description for the next book. And then right after that, I have the first chapter of the next book. And then at the end of that chapter, I have the link 
to where they can go purchase it. So hopefully at that point they're hooked and they're moving on the through thing, the series. The other thing that's surprising is how many people want merchandise associated with their author or their book or their podcast or whatever. And there's an opportunity there also because it's not just selling them stuff. It's about building your audience as a fan base. So when they buy a t-shirt or whatever it is, and I don't know if that's going to sell or not, but these podcasts sell a lot. These, like I listen to a lot of true crime podcasts and a lot of them sell a lot of merch. And so you're building your fan base. It's not just about the money you get from that. You're building your fan base because they're going to wear the t-shirt. What was it? I just saw, I listened to a, a true crime podcast. And I don't remember what the name of it is, right? Because I listened to like eight of them. But I saw a lady wearing a t-shirt and all of a sudden she and I bonded and she's giving me recommendations for other ones because we're all yeah. fans. Yeah. And when we're fans, we want to be evangelists. Yep. And you don't have to pay us to do it. We Anything we love, we want to share. So there's also opportunities there for different kinds of ads. And I know people will bristle when they say ads, but it's really, it's marketing. If you don't do it, you're just leaving attention span and fanship on the table that you're not taking advantage of. I always like the spin on marketing that it is finding the people that are going to like what you have to offer and making sure that they know what you have to offer, That's not forcing point. your work on people who otherwise wouldn't be interested. And then you can legitimately approach it as a favor that you're doing both for yourself from a business point of view and to your potential readers. As a That's an awesome to way to well. look at it because I don't want anyone to buy my stuff. And I'm a marketer. I do that every day. I don't want anyone to buy stuff they don't want, but I want them to buy 100% of the things that they do want that I can help educate them about and tell them so that they understand what's available. Yeah. I do like the idea of when you're talking about comic books, then the visual and merchandising opportunities there are clearer because you have all that visual material right. that lends itself to that. If you're marketing a novel, for example, then I think it's important to be able to think of it in that visual way. I did a conversation with Melissa Addy about hands-off merchandising, and we were talking about how you can legitimately use material like quotes from Shakespeare and put it on a pillow or something like that. And that's okay because it's not covered by copyright. So in some cases it's text, which of course we're all about as writers, but thinking of those visuals as well that are going to attract the attention in the same way that a visual of a comic book is going to grab the reader, like the Red Rocks of Arizona is hopefully going to grab people who say, oh, I went there one time. I love that. I'd love to read a book that's set there. You know, you may have a particularly pithy quote or some piece of dialogue that someone said that would make a really fun t-shirt. And yeah, it's a little bit of work to set up an account to have three t-shirts. But again, sometimes it's not about selling it. Sometimes it's about having it and letting people see it. Yeah. And I think the advantage of hands-off merchandising, which is what I was talking about with Melissa, is right. that I think you cut into your, your sales because those things are more expensive by the very nature of them being POD and having somebody else take care of distribution and so yeah. on. But if all you ever do is go on to Redbubble or something like that, which is where I sell my merch, and make a t-shirt and and buy one yourself and wear it to a conference, that might be as valuable from a marketing point of view as selling a bunch of them would be from a financial point of view. Right. And I agree with you hundred percent that sometimes you just create it for you. Maybe you give them away yeah. You're, and you give away three or five t-shirts or something. People, in order to get people's names, people are very suspect these days about where they put their names because they're getting all sorts of spam, but people still are willing to trade their name and their email address for the chance to get something free and they're not going to give it to you if they don't value the free thing and if they value the free thing they may be very interested in what you're doing so backwards trailing that backwards it can be a very good thing to order 12 of something or 14 of something and have them give away they have to make a good display right and yeah. besides the book what are you going to put on the table oh it's yeah. a t-shirt and or it's a jigsaw puzzle or it's something Jigsaw puzzles might be really good for mysteries, right? Yeah. Because, and you, you can order them and they're just visually. We talked about piecing stories together. The toy industry has done a lot of this, especially action figures. They sell you a toy in a quarter. 
They sell you a toy that you're buying and they sell you a build a figure, which if you buy all four in series, you get enough pieces to put together a second toy. Or in this case, if you're buying four, a fifth toy. That's genius, right? That is because genius. Gets you to buy things. Maybe you wouldn't buy, but you go, oh, but I like that fifth figure. And again, think of books where you're putting together some kind of serialized story where they get that as a bonus. They're not buying yeah. it specifically to get that story. But once they read the first part, they want to read the second part. They already got a full story. They don't feel ripped off, but yeah. they get the second piece of that serial. And the history of publishing has been, look at the Strand publishing Sherlock Holmes, and that was all serialized. And I'm not saying you should yeah. do things that exist from the 1800s, right? <laughs> it may not be the wisest some idea. Some still work. But some of the concepts still work. You just have to yeah. apply it in a modern structure and a modern application. It is cool to think about the analogy that sprung to mind for me when you were talking about the action figures is, and this would be tricky from a writing point of view, but if you had a novella that was legitimately four standalone stories, but if you read each of those standalone stories in order, it would form a larger arc. That would be super cool to have one of those pieces of the novella in each of four or five or however you divvy it up books. And so then maybe there would be some way that the reader could prove that they had purchased all the pieces individually, and then they would receive, they could have easily read each of those as they got to the end of the book that it was part of, but that you make it available to them in a nicer format if, if they've signed up for your newsletter or, or whatever you want the extra to be. The other thing we learned from comic books is those are all serialized stories, right? When you get a 32 page issue, which is pretty much the standard in comic books, it's a serialized story that runs across five or six issues and they plan it on purpose. I forget if it was the eighties or nineties where they started publishing the books in a consolidated form where they would create a trade paperback and it would contain six or seven or eight or 12 issues. And apart from assembling stories from different ages, they would do a series that fit together. And Barnes and Noble or Borders or whatever had said that the perfect size is six issues because they can make enough money at it and it becomes a thick enough book. And to date, it's not that it's always that, but to date, that's around the number where they put into a book. And remember, they're trying to get people to buy the thing for the second time. You bought the issues, now buy the trade paperback. And what they do is they include bonus material. So they publish those six, but then they'll publish sketches. They'll publish maybe the original script or a piece of the original script. They'll do all sorts of things. So authors can do the same thing. You could publish in the back of your book. You could show people the four covers that you intended, that you tested before they actually yeah. got published. Anything that adds interest to you as an author, to you as a writer, to the publishing process that involves them more have them vote after the fact, mm -hmm. cover they liked better. Those are all things that are done in order to drive more interest, especially for the next, if it's in the book, for the next thing you publish. The idea I'm having based on that, this is why I love talking with you, Kara. The, it's fun. I, it is. <laughs> the idea I'm having with that is that I have a number of Antonier Suspense shorts. I think I have six now for sale, and I have one that I'm using as a magnet for my email newsletter. Right. When I'm working on another one, when that's available, then the one that's currently the magnet will become available for sale. You know, so I'll have seven or eight, I forget. And my goal is to have 12, one set in each month of the year, which will be a year of Kinnear. Oh, that's that will nice. be the subtitle. But what I think would be really cool is to have a premium product that would be photographs that are associated with it. So my husband's a photographer, so I could get many of these photographs from him. There are some that are based in Maine. There are many that are based uh, in Philadelphia on the main line, you know, areas, uh, uh, decrepit railroad station way out in the Western suburbs. And it would be cool to have that as like the frontispiece piece for each of those stories. And my only caution there is that if I were to distribute that electronically, I would have to factor in what the delivery costs would be on Amazon for that. The file size would get much larger than it would for just a normal textbook. Right. And so you'd have to make sure that you understood what the delivery cost for that would be. And then for production, obviously, if you wanted to do a print, there would be costs for that as well. But that might be the kind of thing that you 
you just make three print copies or 12 print copies. And that's another good example. I just talked about literary citizenship with Jane Friedman. It would be a cool way to support a fellow creator. If you knew an illustrator or a photographer who could provide those visuals or any other kind of additional content that you could bake in to what would be basically otherwise a textual story. So we haven't talked about this before, but my mind immediately went to something else. And that said that, okay, so now what you could do is think about postcards, right? You could do a postcard set. And again, even if they don't sell, if you use them as decoration for the table or whatever, but yeah. think about those old postcards where they used to have the big lettering on it, right? California, and they showed you the image. You could use those photos and make them into postcards that were promos for your book, or you could sell them. You could sell those promos. The other thing is, what I've seen some book publishers do is trading card size. A business card is nice. It's this big. And, but it doesn't have a lot of space on it. And by the way, people should always use both sides of the business card. If you're cheaping out and using one side of the business card, I say, I, you're just wasting your opportunity to do something because there's lots of things you can do with the reverse side. But think about ordering trading cards and having multiples of them. So you don't have just one trading card. You've got five different ones. And if you're doing a convention, for example, and you're doing it for more than one day, get them to come back to your table by giving one away one day and telling them, oh, tomorrow I have a different card. Yeah. Because there are people who like to collect things. And so that would be an amazing thing to do with that photography that extends its life. You're lucky. You've got lots of things you can do with that photography with that cover art, if you own the cover art, as opposed to you're leasing it or licensing it just for the cover, you can use it on a lot of different things. And you can create merch out of it, you create additional interest, but it's about thinking differently, not just thinking about your book. It's about thinking, how do I promote the book? And how do I have an extension that helps me? You know, it would make a great trailer. Using that photography could make a great trailer yeah. that has minimal animation, but has words flying on the screen and depending on whether it works to help tell the story or the prelude to the story. Yeah. And I think it, just as we were talking before about ways to think about marketing, you think about the things that are going to bring joy to the people that you want to appeal to. Right. And if you're working in an environment that's used to the trading card idea, then that's going to be real appealing to them. Maybe you don't want to blaze the trail into an audience that isn't used to that concept, maybe try it out on a very low level, but think of the things that are going to make them happy and also make you happy because it will earn you their followership. I published two books with my son, right? And they were Says Seth and More Says Seth. Uh, and they were just things that he said as a child. And then I added snarky dad comments afterwards, which by the way, are really, really inappropriate. But I'm dad. <laughs> Your son can't that, read right? it, right? <laughs> at six, he didn't understand what it said. But at 13, I read some of it back to him. He goes, oh my God, that's inappropriate. I said, yeah, but you didn't know that at six, yeah. right? You didn't have yeah. an understanding. We did trading cards for those because I thought it would be really, really fun. And I did trading cards every year and changed them because the truth is you can order trading cards for not much more money than you can order business cards, but you can do something else with trading cards that you can't do with them. They're bigger. You have more space. You can do writing. You can do all sorts of things. As indie authors, we should be looking at, well, I'm going to spend some money for promotion. How am I going to make that connect the best? What am I going to do that's going to stand out from everyone else that will make people remember? Because they may not buy your book then. Your Part of it is expanding your audience. And they work great for stickers, trading cards. I know a lot of times people use bookmarks. I'm not so fond of bookmarks because they're very limited in their use. And mm -hmm. most people don't actually use them for books. So it's a long piece of paper that's skinny. And I think a lot of them get thrown away. But some of those other formats may not get thrown away. One thing that I started doing is yeah. that I got my business cards printed portrait. And yeah. so they serve as both my business card. And because I've really skinny down what I put on my business cards, I had a conversation with Michael Laron about this. We were sort of taking different sides of this, but I basically only have my name 
um, and like the names of my book series, but I don't have like my website or my phone number or anything because I figure there aren't that many Maddie Dalrymple's. If they have my name, right. they can find me online okay. and there aren't that many indie authors with my name with indie spelled the way I spell it. So I figure that if they have my card with basically Maddie Dalrymple on one side and the author on the other and attractive background images, then they can find what they need. But it also makes it look more like, um, a bookmark, which is what I use. Right. If I'm sending out a book through a giveaway or something like that, then I'll put a business card in and it's like a more flexible <laughs> bookmark, like right. you're saying. It's serving multiple purposes. When I helped a gentleman market a book and it was a time travel book based on baseball of the guy going back to 1975, 76. And I said, you know what we should really do? We should really print up business book cards. Yeah, yeah. And so what we did was we took five characters in the book. Some of it was stock photography. One of it was his friends. One of it was him as the author, but he had a small role in the book. And we took the design for 1975 Topps cards. We created these five cards as a set and he would give them away at conventions. Now there was a sense of pride for him. It tied to the concept of the book because baseball trading cards, it just worked really well. And the truth was each card was not more expensive than to do a single business card. And so it all tied together. And for some authors, it might not be a scene of the book, but it might be like a scene of the locations where, where your book's story goes. The thing that that makes me think of is that I have in my, so my Anne Kinnear suspense novels, she is a woman who has a business where she senses spirits and it's all very businesslike. And so often I have a reference to her or her brother giving somebody an Ann Kinnear sensing business card. So right. it'd be pretty obvious for me to have a business card that said Ann Kinnear sensing on one side. Oh and then actually I could give them the URL for the website because I actually have annkinnear.com, which is referenced right. a couple of times in the books. And then further, obviously have a link to my own website. That would be a fun experiment. I think that would be incredible. And it, again, it involves people in the story because they're going to the character's website. That, I think that's great. Yeah, I think anything like that with the uh, trading cards, like you were saying, or the business cards that is erasing that line between fiction and real life is, I always think is super fun. So I just have to ask, because obviously we could talk about this for two hours, but yeah. there's one thing I had to ask, which is tattoo artists. So you actually have a lesson for us from tattoo artists that we can apply to the book world. I do. So the novel that I threatened to write for the last 10 years involves <laughs> something with tattoos. And I didn't know enough about it. So I decided to go to the convention center in Philadelphia during a tattoo show. And I walked around. And obviously they are very, very talented artists. Their canvas is just skin. But what I noticed is they spend a huge amount of money on their cards. These are not plain ink cards. They have multiple foil stamping. They have different surfaces. They have all sorts of things. So when I look at that card and I know what cards cost, they may be spending $200, $250 on their business cards. But their entire goal is to stand out from people who are very, very talented. Now, you put out a card as a writer and you put your name on it and maybe your picture on it, maybe the book cover, and does it really stand out from anything else? And the answer is, for someone who doesn't know you, no. It's just another card to throw in a pile of cards that maybe if I'm interested, but if you did something interesting with it. I've seen them do lenticular cards. They're really expensive. Lenticular remembers that thing that where you move it, it has two or three pictures. Oh, it's got okay. Thin plastic surface. And they're sometimes called flashers. But that's very interesting because no one will ever have seen that before because they're so expensive to manufacture. Or the foil stamping. How do you use foil stamping to enhance what you're doing? Not just to be, oh, it's nice, but does it do something? Could you make it look like neon? Yes, you can absolutely make foil stamping look like neon. What do you do that stops people and they go, wow, look at this card. Yes, it's not your book, but you're always trying to get attention. And it takes something to stop people so that you can get your attention to tell them something about your book, something about your story that they will want to read anyway. But they've got a thousand pieces of advertising hitting them every day. 
I really like that idea because I can imagine going to a conference, a writer's conference or reader's conference and handing someone a card that becomes a conversation starter beyond right. what is on the card. Like the content of the card, yes, you want that to always be a conversation starter, but the very card itself just gives you an opportunity for someone to say, oh my gosh, what's the deal with that card? Look, I can bend it and I see different things and talk about it a little bit. And I guess that's the message of this, that any way that you can expand the interaction you have and deepen the interaction you have with the people that you want to reach and using some of these ideas in order to do that, that's really what everybody's goal is from a marketing point of view. It absolutely is. And if you can tie it back to the theme of the book in some way, if you can do something yeah. that ties it directly back, that's so much the better. Yeah. Well, Gary, obviously we could keep talking and talking, but so fun to talk with you as always. Please let the listeners and viewers know where they can go to find out more about you online. I will. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to share this with other people. I hope that they are inspired and then they write back to you and tell you the cool things that they've done. Yeah, I will definitely point people to the YouTube channel, the indie author, indie with yeah. a Y, I-N-D-Y on YouTube, because that's where I'm pointing people to leave comments. And so there will be links to that. So I'd love to have a conversation, Gary. I think I speak with, for you as well. I'd love to have a conversation with people there about what we've been talking about. Yeah, I would too. Thank you and very much. Sure. And uh, there's, is there a website, a central website? Uh, Gary's Anchor Storyteller.com. So Gary's Anchor Storyteller.com is where I put my stuff up. And hopefully someone sees something there and says, Ooh, that's interesting. That would be great. Thank you so much, Gary. This has been so much fun. Thank you. Take care.